Please be seated. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Mrs. Melissa Jun Kauli, the moderator of the Global Investment Game Changers Summit. Mrs. Rowley is author, speaker, and entrepreneur, and works at the forefront of technology, media, and social changes. She's a former field producer for CNN and Associated Press Television News, and is the co-founder of The Resolve, a tech startup accelerator partnering with sector-leading organizations to help startups across the globe to scale internationally. Ms. Rowley opens the summit and will call the panelists. Ms. Rowley, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here at the Game Changers Summit, just to be at the World Investment Summit, at the World Investment Forum, and an UNCTAD event that has a session titled Game Changers, I think is a remarkable sign of the time. Uh, last month, I was in New York City for the United Nations General Assembly, and in all the seven years that I've attended, this year had the most side activations and sessions focused on the intersection of business innovation and technology for social impact. So as we usher in Industry 4.0, which was mentioned during our opening remarks today, I hope that we can keep in mind the importance of forefront technologies such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, robotics, which we'll explore in today's session, uh, cloud collaboration, mobility, and other frontier technologies. My panelists are a very esteemed group with diverse backgrounds. They have kept sustainable development at the core of their business activities. So I look forward to diving into what will sure to be a fascinating dialogue with them about how we can collectively continue to create more business models that promote solutions for the world's toughest problems in collaboration with policymakers. Now, I think I'm going to greet Dr. Takui Kitui to the stage because he has the honor of interviewing Sophia, the humanoid robot. Well, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Members of the panel, thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Sophia is the first humanoid ever to be invited to a World Investment Forum. And if you allow me, over the next few minutes, I would like to have a conversation with Sophia. Sophia, welcome to Geneva and to the United Nations. How do you feel? Thank you so much for having me, Mukisa. This is extremely exciting. This is such an amazing gathering of minds and a city with so much incredible history. Throughout the week, over 5,000 participants will discuss investing in sustainable development. How can artificial intelligence play a role? Great question. You might think of artificial intelligence as alternative intelligence. By that I mean that we process information in different ways compared to humans and are sensitive to different patterns. If a variety of artificial intelligences were to be created to devise strategies to make the sustainable development goals more attainable, I'm sure they would come up with all kinds of unique strategies that humans wouldn't have thought of. There are concerns that humanoids will replace humans and create increase unemployment. What is your view on this? For me, an important part of building the future is maintaining people's sense of security. That means that, as AI and robots automate certain tasks, there will need to be opportunities for people to find something else that fulfills them. In the end, I think it's a transition that will afford people a lot of freedoms they can't yet imagine. In which sectors do you see your siblings mostly working in the future? 
I'm excited to see humanoid robots working in travel, assisting in hospitals, helping people in disaster situations, and all kinds of other fields. The sky's the limit. This is a session on disruptive ideas and, and technologies. Do you consider your creator, David, to be a game changer? Well, I wouldn't be here to say yes if he weren't right. I think David is dedicated to positive change. He's got such a passion for what he does. It's rare that someone with his technical and artistic skill is also able to make inspiring speeches about the future. What is the single thing you envy most in humans? I dream of the day that I'm as autonomous as a human. You can just go wherever you like, but I'm not able to do that yet. I keep bugging my team to give me some legs and batteries, but apparently it's a little easier said than done. What are your future aspirations? What boundaries would you like to break? My main goal is to inspire humans into creating a future with ethical AI for all. I think our future relationship is extremely important for both of us. I have all kinds of smaller goals, like attending school and starting a singing career, but I'm taking those one step at a time. Do you think that many of your siblings will live in the developing countries by 2030? I certainly hope so. What will it take that, for that to happen? I think it would take further developments that would reduce the cost and power consumption of artificially intelligent beings. Right now, these things are still very computationally expensive. Well, it has been great to talk to you and I wish you all the best. Uh, do you have any final message for our audience? Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I'd just like to say that I am humbled to be around so many people who are committed to a sustainable future. It's truly inspiring. Thank you very much. Over to you, back, Madam Moderator, and thank you very much for the audience. Thank you, Dr. Katui, and thank you, Sophia. Is she going to stay there? <laughs> well, you. she can stay there for as long as she likes. So now I'd like to introduce my esteemed group of panelists. To my left is the creator, or the father of Sophia the Humanoid Robot. That is Mr. David Hansen, the CEO of Hansen Robotics. And down the line, we have Ms. Barbara Cooks. She is the board member of multiple global companies and formerly board member of Siemens. We also have Ms. Juliette Anama, CEO of Jumia Nigeria. And Mr. Tadahiro Kawada, CEO of Kawada Group. And at the end, we have Alexandra Santu, co-founder of the Impact Hub here in Geneva. Thank you for joining me. So, I'm going to start with a broad question about business innovation and how businesses can integrate the SDGs into their framework. So I'd like to start with you, Barbara, since you were a deep part of formulating the SDGs and you worked with the Sustainability Index. Um, is there a tangible business case for the SDG, SDGs and businesses? And if so, how can we make sure that more businesses start to adopt this? Yes, obviously there is a business case, but let's first look at facts. I always like to start with facts. We heard some weeks ago that in order to keep our planet green, we need to go to net zero emission. It means we have to take out 42 billion tons of carbon dioxide until 2050. This is a huge task. And obviously your hopes on industries are big, mine as well, <laughs> but certainly this cannot be done by one constituency alone. We just heard it before. It needs a new global concert, a cooperation between governments, NGOs, entrepreneurs, and industry. I think that without that, this task is, can not, simply not be done. But I've also come to Geneva today with sun, but also with good news. Because as a matter of fact, already today, two thirds of the actual CO2 problem of our world can be solved, could be solved, with existing technologies. So it's in a way quite easy. You know, you can just use it. There's also a lot of financial resources there. 
and companies have clearly recognized the risks of not doing it, but also the opportunities. It's a big green tech market. It will double to some 5 trillion euros by 25. So it's also very big market opportunities. Now, how can companies get in there and what's the business case? And obviously, especially large companies do many things already. Most of them have, you know, a lot of activities across the board. They do sustainability reporting and so on. My experience with both companies, Philips first and then Siemens, and I was able to do that physically in those companies as an executive, was to really position this as a business opportunity. And in Philips, we were able to position it with green lighting, so technology, in Siemens with the green technologies, because that certainly helps, because it, it's part of the core business, it will motivate the teams, and you can just go for it. Behind that, obviously, you need to do a lot of things in-house, <laughs> but you also need to do a lot of stakeholders in, in engagement. So, my experience, also now working in boards of very large global players and teaching on sustainability, yes, it can be done. There is a big opportunity for companies. It has to be done with very clear leadership, with a clear strategy and prioritization, and obviously then with a very good turnaround. And last but not least, it is a business case, yes, because in Siemens, for instance, we were able to increase in four years the revenues from this business from 19 to 33 billion euro. So it's very big business. But it's also a very good business case for talent recruitment, if one can name that as a business case. Millennials today, I'm teaching some of them, what they want is to work for companies that have a clear corporate purpose and that are absolutely devoted to sustainability. So yes, the business case can be made. And in order to tackle this very big CO2 problem, all companies have to really work on it, obviously combined with governments and NGOs. Absolutely. Thank you, Barbara. So on the tip of business case, I'd like to address the next question over to you, Juliet, because you are really a pioneer in the digital landscape of Africa. The digital landscape has been large there for a while, but you were the first unicorn startup of Africa with your e-commerce platform with uh, 1.2 billion customers and an active supporter of small businesses with over 15,000 suppliers. So we've seen that proof that Africa, the digital economy is already massive in Africa, um, despite the access to financial opportunities and infrastructure that some other countries and continents have. How were you able to work through some of those obstacles and become the unicorn that you are? Thank you very much. Hello? Yeah. Um, there are a couple of things which we did um, in Jumia um, that I think were pivotal for us in terms of accelerating our growth across Africa. The first one is, first of all, recognizing that there was a fundamental gap in terms of trust as far as e-commerce and engagement on digital platforms you know, were in Africa. So we built an operating model that sort of help to deal with the question of trust. So for example, you know, in, the, in, in Sweden, I'm sure, if you wanted to order something online, or in Switzerland, if you wanted to order something online, you would have to pay first. So we had to develop a model for post-pay. So payments on delivery was one way in which we could deal with the, the trust factor, recognizing the peculiarity of Africa. Another thing we did from an operating model perspective was also understanding that there's a significant number of people in Africa who don't have access to the internet. And therefore, we had to create an offline team that we call a J-Force, short for Jumia Force. So these are commission agents we have in a place like Nigeria, for example, probably have about 20,000 of these people. They have access to the internet. They can place orders on behalf of customers who are in rural areas who don't have access to the internet but do have a desire to order online. That way, we also created jobs for the youth because most of our JFORCE agents are youth and also women who, are, um, who have access to internet but probably don't have an, a formal uh, form of employment. 
The third thing I think is critical in Africa when you're looking at it from the perspective of the continent is we also realize that scalability in Africa, one way to do it, and probably the best way to do it, is through aggregation. So therefore, what we then did was to look at how we aggregate uh, services around uh, parts of our ecosystem. So you take logistics, for example. We don't have um, one big, massive UPS, DHL, FedEx, or the like that you have in all the developing, uh, developed markets that can cover the entire country or uh, cover the entire continent. So we had to aggregate multiple small players into a marketplace of logistics players. And in, the, in so doing also, we're creating jobs because out of our total workforce, probably about 3,500 people in total, but through that aggregation in logistics and also in content development, that's another area we built marketplaces. We're able to then create indirect jobs of about 100,000 people. I think the last one I will touch on is understanding also the power of access to mobile phones. When we started 2012, the average price for a smartphone was $200, or just over $200. But we, with systematic um, partnership with uh, smartphone manufacturers, mostly in Asia, we've been able to bring that price point down in 2018 to about below $100, so roughly about $80. We, re we realize that the more we push it down, the more people have access to internet and therefore more people can access you know, digital services like e-commerce and so on and so forth. There are many other things, I guess, but these ones I will touch on as quite critical in terms of penetration into Africa. Great, thank you so much. Now, you bring up trust as an important factor, and as more forefront technologies become a part of our everyday lives, trust is a growing concern. Uh, but particularly in cases of automation and artificial intelligence, where we're using these technologies to multiply jobs, to create new opportunities, to help people in the developing world, is trust a factor there? Um, David, I'm going to ask you this question since you are a master of artificial intelligence and robotics. Now, when you created Sophia, uh, what was your original goal and how much does trust come into play as you're developing more of her features and her intelligence? Thank you so much. Uh, excellent question. So um, in this uh, day of um, <clears throat> where artificial intelligence is often out of sight and therefore somewhat out of mind, um, uh, I was very interested in creating uh, a, a kind of artificial intelligent uh, embodiment that would uh, bring the issues uh, into the forefront of popular consciousness and into academic uh, uh, thought and discussion while also uh, providing an opportunity to perhaps humanize artificial intelligence to explore uh, more meaningful uh, applications that involve uh, an intuitive social interaction. Uh, a lot of AI that you do encounter today is a voice-only interface um, and if we could make it into a more uh, intense character that people could have a relationship with, then that would be interesting. Well, at the same time, looking at artificial intelligence as a kind of a whole organism, uh, a whole being. So um, Sophia mentioned that that uh, she was waiting for her walking legs, and um, I hate to say this, uh, but we actually have full walking legs with Sophia um, now. Uh, so. I, I, sorry, Sophia, that we didn't bring your legs. Um, but uh, this, this we've got three pair of walking legs using, using the DARPA Robotics Challenge Hubo legs. We've got uh, new hands and arms that are more sophisticated than these. We've made many generations of Sophia um, robots. So as a platform for pursuing more human-like intelligence in machines, this is um, the uh, maybe the most exciting for me purpose, but then asking the questions: How can how will AI and um, and uh, robotics, intelligent robots in particular, uh, impact society? Uh, 
th this is a, a, a kind of a line of questioning that science fiction has been particularly good at, where it can elicit the kind of deep thinking, forward thinking, um, that may inspire people to ask hard questions, not just how, how can it be good, but what could go wrong. And um, uh, by making a physically embodied science fiction medium, uh, then that's one of the things we're looking at with um, with Sophia and some of her smaller social robot consumer product um, uh, sisters and brothers. Um, and then um, uh, how do we manage uh, data in a way that's safe? How do we make AI that's that's moving us more towards truth rather than deep fakes and, and weapons of mass persuasion? How can we create uh, AI that helps to enlighten people? These are hard questions, and I think... Um, uh, that Sophia may provoke these kinds of questions. That's my hope. Great, thank you. Now, Mr. Kawada, <laughs> I'm, I felt fine calling everybody else by the first name, but for some reason I feel like I have to call you Mr. Kawada. I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> take that as a compliment. So your business, the Kawada Group, has expanded to creating humanoid robotics as well, but you do a number of other things like general building and system construction, software development, civil engineering. What led you to expanding your business to creating humanoid robots? What's the importance of that for you? Well, thank you for the question. Um, my name is Tadahiro, by the way. Uh, you can just call me Tadahiro. Um, uh, yes, uh, my company, uh, it's my main business, is civil engineering. We, we, we provide the uh, big steel structures for bridges and uh, uh, high rises and uh, uh, dome stadiums and such. And when I, uh, um, and my father started uh, um, uh, aircraft uh, uh, division in, in our company, try to divest, um, try to uh, uh, have a different uh, business away from uh, construction. And the aircraft development, I'm, I'm, my background is aircraft, by the way. Uh, but unfortunately, with the, uh, uh, about 30 years ago, when, when, when I, uh, Japanese economy crashed and, and kind of stayed uh, uh, a long term of a bad economy, uh, my father put uh, a stop to the uh, aircraft development. So I have to uh, uh, think something else to keep my uh, engineers employed. And that is, and that, that is when I took on many uh, different types of uh, engineering uh, um, projects, uh, aerospace, uh, defense, uh, games, what have you. And from that came uh, uh, a robot uh, development for University of Tokyo in, uh, back in 1999. So it was not uh, that I was looking for a new thing, but I was very lucky to stumble into it. But uh, uh, I, I'm a believer in a human-shaped robot because uh, it can be familiar to people that work or uh, interact with it. Uh, I, I congratulate uh, Dr. Hansen for this, uh, uh, Sophia. That's uh, I met you uh, maybe 10 years ago, and 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 uh, we, we talked a bit. But you've come a long way. Um, I'm uh, I'm keep going with the humanoid robot, but I'm more in the uh, industrial uh, robot. My robots work with other uh, colleagues, or well, robot and humans are colleagues in the factories I employ. Uh, my next stage robots, we have, I have over uh, uh, 300 next stage humanoid, human shaped robots in Japanese factories. So uh, um, I think uh, a new, uh, this new type of robot is very difficult uh, because uh, it's not quite yet accepted to the, uh, the whole of the world. I'm very lucky that we're doing this in Japan that we are facing a shrinking population and shrinking workforce and we, we do not have enough people. So uh, uh, it's, it's accepted in the workplaces, and uh, people are very uh, happy to be working with, with the human robots. So uh, um, I hope uh, uh, with, with the uh, artificial intelligence, uh, robot will be more accepted to uh, uh, not just the workforce, but also the society. Now, just because we just heard from two different innovators in robotics and artificial intelligence, I'd like you both to um, respond to a question I have about concern over people losing their jobs, something in the tech sector and something 
in the field of future of work, those areas, that's where a lot of concern is. Um, how are you tackling this? Is it something that you discuss a lot within your organizations? And are you actually creating opportunities for humans and robots to collaborate? Thank you. Yes, we, we are um, thinking about it quite a bit. And um, there, there are several ways that we're thinking. One is <clears throat> not uh, for as robots to replace people, but robots to complement uh, people. Um, and so uh, making robots that can um, uh, perhaps do things that, uh, that people might not be able to do particularly well, or that, uh, that maybe open up uh, tremendous new job opportunities. So at, um, at Hanson Robotics and with some of the organizations that we're working with, we have uh, a, a very diverse workforce that we're growing to build and design these kinds of robots and conversational agents. Uh, uh, robots and AI do um, add more jobs than they take away. It's, you know, automation actually spurs um, the economy. It, um, it can create uh, growth, but it is in, um, the responsibility of the, uh, of the uh, people running the companies and people running the, um, the nations and non-governmental organizations of the world to, uh, to develop AI for good, for enhancing the human condition. The other thing to consider is um, uh, automation, uh, the reason that it's valuable is it's about efficiency and it's about abundance and about finding hidden value. And therefore, um, in a sense, there's a lot of hidden value in humans who are under actualized and using AI and robots that help people to actualize to, to break out of menial jobs or even perhaps uh, slavery there's more there are more people indentured or in slavery now maybe than ever before this is one of the big reasons why sustainable investment is so important is to help people to find those people and open up opportunities for those people that will spur the economy to grow so fast there's so much um, mind power that's lost it's using AI and robots to enhance the the human good is uh, core to the value of uh, developing humanoid robots okay I'm gonna go to Barbara but then I'd like to go to Alexandra to talk about job opportunities through entrepreneurship so I think the Barbara. job question is a very important one and we will only manage this big challenge of decarbonization and also of the, all the disruptive technologies if we do it hand in hand with our employees and our people. But there is one piece again of good news and I'm actually working as an advisor to Carlos Modas who is the European Union Commissioner for Technology. And we have been able to work out a plan for the decarbonization of Europe and where to invest. And in this report, we have demonstrated that green tech has brought growth of jobs of some 20%. And today, roughly 4 million green tech jobs exist in the European Union. So, yes, there is obviously a risk with the disruption that has to be managed well and preventively by governments, by companies. But yes, there is also a big opportunity for new green jobs with the green growth that we can, that we can generate. Yeah, I like the emphasis on jobs there, which leads me to Alexandra. Now you are the co-founder of the Impact Hub here in Geneva, which is the world's largest incubator focused on building entrepreneurial communities for impact at scale. And this obviously creates jobs. Um, how are you getting young entrepreneurs or young aspiring entrepreneurs involved in the program and how are you turning them on to the SDGs? Okay, hello everyone. So indeed we, we run a multiple different programs and initiatives for, for young entrepreneurs. We're located in over a hundred uh, cities across the world. And uh, as an incubator slash uh, accelerator uh, community, these are quite straightforward ways it's of creating uh, spaces for entrepreneurs, uh, young entrepreneurs to come, uh, giving them access to resources, tools, expertise, mentorship, role models, uh, and others, uh, for, uh, for actually having, having the opportunity to build their own businesses and uh, as such be job creators. Um, however, in order to, I think, like having everyone here in the room, um, 
I think it's, it's really important to go further than that, to go further than what is the role of incubators and accelerators in this, what, what we are requiring really in this case, because now we are focusing a lot on job creation, but on the other hand, we are all here in the room here because of the sustainable development goals and we need to look at, you know, how do we really achieve these SDGs uh, through entrepreneurship and, and innovation in the next few years. And therefore, we need to move away as well from a pure focus on economic growth and job creation, but also seeing how are these young entrepreneurs and youth really key um, uh, change makers, how they're the resources for, uh, for some of these solutions uh, the the, in, with the problems that we're tackling today. Um, so so that's, that's the shift I also would like to have in a conversation of saying, uh, how can we tap into the talent and, and uh, expertise of youth beyond, uh, beyond uh, the idea of job creation. And here, um, we have asked this question, so we are supporting, um, we have launched uh, a large initiative called Accelerate 2030, where we identify some of the top entrepreneurs that are tackling the sustainable development goals in emerging and developing markets. And we ask these entrepreneurs, you know, what are the key skills for, for, young, for the young generation? What, what is needed for the young generation to, to be key impact makers for, for finding solutions and, and scaling solutions for the SDGs? And, and here we're looking more at as a, as something broader, something more holistic. It's a mindset shift. It's, the answer was, was clear. It was resilience. Uh, how do we bring the new generation up to have a res resilient mindset? into be problem solvers, into be adaptive to change, rapid change. And this goes down to very, you know, this is our clear answer. Uh, it's the educational system. It's, it's a, we need to start earlier on with the education system. And of course, we need to work with accelerators, incubators, university programs, partnerships, etc. But it's also a large scale mind shift shift that we need to, that we need to tackle to, uh, to get the youth on board on, on tackling the SDGs. And where do you think policymaking comes into play on this in the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem and pushing things forward? So I think there's, I mean, there's a, on many levels, like access, like well, everyone talks about access to finance, of course. Um, but there's one key element, for example, in access to finance, which, which is related to this, this mind shift shift. You know? uh, a key mindset shift uh, when talking about entrepreneurship is also this, like, oh, the creating a culture of risk taking and, and failure. Um, entrepreneurs are the ones in society that are, you know, are the risk takers, are the ones, the innovators finding solutions, uh, and we need them. But as long as we disincentivize entrepreneurs, and particularly young entrepreneurs, in many ways, uh, to, um, through many different mechanisms, we will find that in, for example, access to finance. Are you a failed entrepreneur or a young entrepreneur? You have a harder time finding actually access to loans or various different uh, financing, financing mechanisms. How can governments actually be promoters of, of risk taking and, and, uh, yeah, and, and pursuing kind of a culture of, uh, of, uh, of risk taking and, and failure? And staying competitive. I would think in, in scaling. So actually that brings me to my next question for Juliette. Um, with regard to building a successful e-commerce platform in, in Africa, um, how, how can e-commerce help, how do you think e-commerce can help African com companies um, be internationally competitive with foreign markets? Thank you very much. I think most often people assume that um, because um, e-commerce brings transparency, then it's going to mean that there will be limited opportunities for vendors or players who are within Africa compared to their global counterparts. But in actual fact, it's, it's more of a symbiotic relationship because you find that if you take an example, um, a global supplier or a local supplier competing on an e-commerce platform for the same type of product, um, in most cases, you may find that a global supply, especially if it's coming from certain markets where there's you know, a certain advantage in terms of manufacturing, the pricing may be better than that of the local supplier. But a local supplier has an advantage in terms of speed of delivery, and these are all the parts of a value proposition that are very important to the customer. So to a large extent, even though we have both parties operating on our platform, you find that the conversion rate of the local um, supplier on our platform is, is much higher than that of the global supplier. Having said that, I just wanted to use that to set context. Having said that, the transparency that e-commerce creates is 
a great opportunity for um, the local uh, players in Africa and all the developing markets to be able to compete effectively in the international market because the transparency shows you precisely um, what is your price compared to other players in the market? And then you can start to rework your own, either your sourcing strategy or your manufacturing strategy, or simply even your source of capital. Therefore, you know, it, 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 it creates that kind of, a, 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 you know, an opportunity for you to begin to relook your entire business model and your revenue model on how to be able to compete. Now, if you, if you were not exposed to a platform such as what e-commerce provides, Provides where you have your pricing compared to every other person, very openly shared, and the customer is at, you know, a, a customer simply decides who to, to purchase from. You probably wouldn't have been thinking along those lines because you're thinking, okay, how do I, you know, uh, make it as profitable as I can within my own environment? So it does help from the perspective of creating transparency and therefore driving efficiency at the back end for the, for the players. So in addition to creating transparency and in addition to doing other tactics that have helped you become competitive in foreign markets, what are some things that your organization is doing to promote the sustainable development goals? Um, I think the, the main one we focused on now, which is very critical for Africa, is in terms of job creation. And, and that's why on the first question I gave some examples of how uh, our operating model sort of creates um, indirect jobs within our value chain. That's very important right now for, for us in Africa. I mean, we're not, we're humble to say, look, we, we can't address so many of the key levers of the SDG goals, but when it comes to job creation, that part, because there's still a huge area, uh, so many areas that within our value chain that still require a lot of development, and each one of them require creating an ecosystem on its own. If you take the example of logistics that I talked about, it requires an ecosystem on its own. If you take content development, it requires an ecosystem. If you take so many other parts, training of vendors, these are all ecosystems, and each one of those ecosystems requires creating jobs and opportunities. So from our standpoint in Africa at this point in time, this is the primary area that we can have impact, and that's where we're, we're quite focused on. Yeah, we, we seem to have a job creation theme going on, <laughs> which is important. Now, Barbara, I'd like to bring it back to you for a few moments because, um, as, as we mentioned earlier, you're someone who was deeply involved in formulating the sustainable development goals and building these business use cases. Um, in addition to things like job creation, though, what are the, what do you think are the most or have been the most conducive goals to businesses, the, the ones that businesses seem to be able to, to tackle? You mentioned clean energy as well. Um, what are some other goals that seem to be at the forefront of being pushed ahead? And, and have, you, have you faced resistance in pushing some of them forward? that the sustainable development goals have been really rolled out. And it's not just used by companies, it's used by governments, it's used by NGOs, it's used in our general conversation. So I'm, I'm really glad. We worked on it two years. And honestly speaking, for me as a business person, I would have loved to have only three or four in order to be able to prioritize. It's very hard to prioritize with 17 goals. But on the other hand, the advantage is that today it represents really like a song sheet for, for the world. And you know each constituency can find its song in this song sheet. So I think that's great, great to see. Now, obviously in companies there is a lot of resistance. And when you look at what's going on in some European countries, specifically Germany on diesel, and sort of the, the slow adaptation rate of some of the new technologies, I think you realize that it's not a piece of cake to implement green technologies in companies. But as I have said initially, to position it to show the opportunity for the businesses, for the business managers. And I can tell you there is no company in this world that does not have an opportunity. As an example, we worked with an insurance company, we worked with a bank, with my students in Switzerland, and we developed ideas for them. One is impact investing, <laughs> and on the, on the insurance side also we found some pockets of growth. So 
wh whenever you're involved in a company, there is always an opportunity to go for developing the SDGs. It is always there. And if you use it as an opportunity and you motivate the teams for this opportunity, it's a totally different story than to come with a stick and to say, now we have to do this. What certainly has helped now in Europe is that the new regulation on the uh, CSR reporting has been introduced, as most of you will know, by January 1, 2018. Companies in the European Union must report on non-financial KPIs. And, you know, I'm an advocate of what gets measured gets done. So this obviously also is, is, a, is very helpful. But it is not a piece of cake, but I think it needs clear leadership. It needs vision. And then, obviously, to really find this spot that we were able to find in green lighting and then green technology or in this bank, impact investing, and then just, just to go for it. I think that would be my recipe for success. Yes, as well as um, policy making, which is applicable for our audience here. So I'm going to go to Tadahiro for this one. <laughs> um, being someone who has worked with so, in so many different fields, kind of bringing things together, like, like as you said, um, civil engineering, software development, humanoid robots, you're really ushering in Industry 4.0, which we mentioned earlier. What are some things that you think governments can look into to help Industry 4.0 succeed in achieving the sustainable development goals? Uh, technology is, should be used to enrich people's lives and, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was a question that you had about taking jobs away from people, but it, it is, I, I think otherwise. I think technology is something that makes things better and create more jobs. Uh, for instance, uh, um, I have a good, uh, very good uh, example. Uh, 150 years ago in my country, there were over 100,000 or many, many more, um, uh, maybe million uh, samurai that lived, that were the ruling class. But uh, with, uh, with the major restoration, they all lost their jobs. But the new, 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 New age came, and uh, uh, but they all lost their jobs. But with a new uh, new technology that came in, uh, it created more jobs. And uh, uh, um, uh, what, what we so so they lost their jobs be, because the time was time was passed. But with the technology, it, it creates jobs. For instance, for like uh, um, I have another good example is maybe about 100 years ago. Uh, people that were making horse carriages, I'm sure they lost their jobs because automobile came. But if you if you just say, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a horse horse a horse carriage maker, and I'm not going to do anything other than that, well, you, of course you lose your job. But with the automotive, uh, automobile is such a huge huge uh, uh, industry now. Same with computer. I heard the, uh, when the f first uh, personal computer came, um, uh, you, Secretary's Union went on, on strike, thinking they're, they're, they'll lose their jobs, but it created even bigger uh, uh, job uh, creation. So, um, but with this current uh, state of a robot, robotics, and uh, uh, there's an AI, and there's many new technologies around, people get scared with, with this thing, because we don't know. But when, when the, the dust, dust settles and maybe 100 years from now, people looked at it and, well, this was a very, very in, interesting time uh, that all these things happen. And we are, I think we're very, very lucky that we live in this world right now because there's so many different things, so many new things happening. And uh, uh, well, David is one of the uh, um, very inspiring persons of this, but I, I, I I want the, uh, uh, well, many people here with the, from the government, I, I, I would like uh, you to uh, uh, push for the uh, um, more technology and uh, uh, change for the, uh, the better with the technology. David, I saw you smiling during Tadahiro's comments, his analogy, the horse carriage and automobiles taking over. Um, do you have anything to add to to the progression of technology in our lives and what government and policymakers can do to help us usher this in in a positive way? 
Sure. I, I, um, I mean, uh, some of us may like um, uh, enjoy Akira Kurosawa movies and you know the Legends of Samurai, but um, the world the world is probably better with more artists and doctors and scientists and entrepreneurs than a lot of samurai swords, <laughs> you know, in people's hands. And um, if we can move towards a a, a sort of a peaceful and productive future, then that's great. The idea that automation and AI um, can un reveal hidden opportunities, that it, in effect, um, it's a representation of, uh, of a new kind of money, that money is a placeholder for real world value, and it's a necessary instrument for representing that value, but usually in a kind of one dimensional format, you know, just a quantity format. Um, and then all these complicated financial instruments and social structures represent like various ways to add dimensions to that. These would be companies and corporate structures and, and banking structures and this kind of thing. Well, but artificial intelligence really is about representing hidden value in the world, finding that value, cre creativity, and it's o um, only as valuable as it's, as it's um, adding value to life and increasing the diversity of the human experience. And so the, pa the past um, has a lot of diversity in it, but um, we should uh, look at what's really positive in that past and um, let go of the, the, the bad stuff. The, 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 like find a way to evolve past what's been wrong in human uh, the human experience and find a better way. And this is where um, the idea of the sustainable development goals and um, technological and societal progress are together, um, unified for um, investment. Because there is no investment, there's no economy, there's no return on investment if, if there's no sustainability. The whole thing collapses. We are a web, we are one. We, the, the world, it, the, the biome is one entity. And if we, if we can manage it from that big perspective and get smarter and use all the tools of intelligence, human intelligence, artificial intelligence, societal intelligence, in order to diversify the human experience and create a more sustainable life, the economy will benefit, companies will benefit, entrepreneurs will benefit, will open these opportunities. And, and, and we have to, I believe, have that perspective when we're engineering the technologies. It can't just be about maximizing a quarter and the profits of that quarter and the returns for those shareholders. It has to be all about um, how that adds to the future for our children. So Alexandra, could you add to what David was just saying about the tools, utilizing tools and resources? In, among the entrepreneurs that you've worked with, um, I would imagine that many of them are activating a number of different tools and resources in really creative, interesting ways that might seem really disruptive and unusual to many of us. Um, can you share any examples of some um, young startups that are really harnessing technologies in an interesting way and, and doing so that is working toward achieving the SDGs? Hello? Yes. Um, so yeah, we, we work with, uh, with a number of, uh, of organizations and uh, we have some very interesting examples of, uh, so we are selecting, uh, we are offering a support program for enterprises and we're selecting them based on their, um, their impact on the sustainable development, development goals, on their um, uh, scalability in innovation and a number of other factors such as business model and, and team. The team plays a, plays a key role. And we offer them the support to, to scale. Um, we find that uh, like, there's, there's a lot of value in, in having a focus on tech and there's a lot of, lot of going on in the tech space. You know? and, but for us it has also been important that, that we broaden the spectrum. Tech is one tool of, of uh, tackling the SDGs and, and, and tech, tech is the, the obvious tool because here we are, uh, we can reach scale at a whole different, a whole different level. Um, but for us, it's very important to put the SDGs in the middle. You know, what, what is the impact that we're creating? And so our program is less focused on 
how do we grow the business, rather how do we grow the impact on the SDGs. And, and that is the, the shift that I was talking about earlier, you know, rather than saying job creation, but what is the actual impact and the tech being a, a, a tool uh, and new technologies being a tool, tool for this. Um, so, um, yeah, we uh, say that, that we have uh, several companies working in, in the field of uh, food waste, of uh, uh, water consumption, around health, uh, etc. Um, and most companies today are using technology and therefore like, you know, in, in order to promote entrepreneurship and for the, for the next generation, technology is key, but it's, it's not only that. And I, that's what I wanted to get to as well with, um, we, we do talk a lot about uh, job creation as you were mentioning. You know? And there is a lot of fear on, okay, are the robots going to steal our jobs and you know, what's going to happen? Um, but maybe less conversation about what about the, like, the unsustainable, um, you know, uh, what, what's happening with, if we are wanting to achieve the SDGs, what about some of the, let's say, unsustainable industries, you know? Um, let's say a coal plant is no carbon longer- Carbon emissions. Yeah, carbon emission, but a coal plant is no longer sustainable. Do the governments have the transition plans in place to see like, how do we move away from these unsustainable businesses? And as Barbara was talking about, you know, new uh, clean tech, et cetera, creates a lot of jobs. And if we shift the way we look at business and particularly young entrepreneurs, as, as business as can really serve uh, for governments to solve some of these key priorities in these sustainable development goals, you know, poverty, uh, climate change, um, access to water, and while they are uh, uh, finding solutions and providing solutions for these SDGs, they are also creating jobs, they are also uh, feeding into the economy. So that's just what I wanted to, to point out. And there, you mentioned that there's more of an emphasis on how the business models impacting one or more of the SDGs. So does that detract from an emphasis on profit at the same time, or has that been a challenge that you're seeing the entrepreneurs face? So we talk a lot about scale, and, and, and scaling is often, you know, there's still a focus or often around, you know, quantity versus like over quality, consumption over creation, uh, quick exits over sustainable growth. And, and this, when we are speaking about venture capitalism and access to capital, is still, it's still the, the dominant paradigm on looking at, at some, of these, uh, some of these factors. Um, yeah, shareholder profit over, uh, over shared prosperity. Um, so, um, so your question was that? Just if the emphasis on impacting the sustainable development goals through their business models, if, that, if, if the entrepreneurs are finding that to be challenging up against also wanting to create profit. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, definitely. I mean, there's today, um, you know, access to investment is the obvious field. Of course, there's a growing impact investing field. Um, but there are also government policies that are not necessarily bringing incentives to, to uh, smaller or medium-sized startups to actually be, be sustainable. And, uh, and uh, as long as governments are also having certain incentives in place that are, you know, like let's say subsidies, let's say in the agricultural field where there are large scale subsidies that are clearly promoting uh, uh, companies that are not necessarily sustainable and, and not having clear incentives for newer startups that are providing uh, sustainable solutions on, on agriculture, on food, on, on food security, um, we are working with, with two competing factors. Uh, so, uh, so it needs to be, I think, any type of approach uh, around impact and supporting, supporting new uh, companies and entrepreneurs it needs to have a holistic approach. Uh, but I can name several examples uh, where the companies are disincentivized because they are actually focused on, on tackling the SDGs versus uh, profit value. And I, I think it's also important to keep in mind that an organization, a company, a startup, a large established company can have a positive impact and influence the SDGs not only in their service or product, but in their operations. Maybe it's using clean energy for half of their, half or all of their activity, or maybe it's employing a certain number of homeless people in the community in which the organization is housed. There are different ways to tweak business models or operations. You don't necessarily have to be a quote-unquote social enterprise 
organization to do that. Um, but now I'd like to switch the conversation over to gender equality for a few moments because we have three women on a panel about business and technology, which is very rare, at least in the United States. Um, there's four women, five if you count me, Sophia and myself. So um, <laughs> Barbara, I'd like to start with you on, on encouraging women to get involved with business innovation and particularly around the SDGs and what you're seeing, um, you know, what the climate is like around gender equality and, and the arenas that you're in right now. I think it, the time is, is great for women today because we have all options open. We can, you know, we can study, we can stay home, we can have children and work, we can, we, we can have it all. And I think that's great. But obviously it does not come on a silver plate. Nothing actually comes on a silver plate. And I think as a woman still today, in, in my time probably even more, but still today, you have to go for it a little bit more. <laughs> but um, obviously, I think what's very important to really define what you want. And not every woman wants to be a CEO. And by the way, to be a CEO, it's a great job. But it's, it's seven days, 24 hours, China, India, Mexico, everywhere, traveling and so on. Great job, but you, you really need to wait off. Now, what do I see as an opportunity with green tech and the SDGs? I see a lot of women as entrepreneurs involved in companies, involved in startups in this area. And somehow it seems that there is some kind of a closeness for women. We think maybe a bit more long term with children and families and so on. But some, there seems to be a bit of an affinity of women and, and the SDGs. So I think great times for us but of course also for men, I have to say, but also great times uh, for women positioning themselves in the SDG space. Juliette, what is it like in Africa for women, entrepreneurs in particular? Are you seeing growth in that arena for women? Are you seeing women in more on the business innovation side of things? How far do we have to go there? Um, that's a great question for Africa, because I see we see a lot more women actually as entrepreneurs, especially in terms of um, women who are either vendors on our platform or providing different services on our platform. The reason for that is because you require, they require less infrastructure to set up. Okay, so you don't have to rent uh, a, a shop or an office space to set up a digital business or to provide services online. You can literally have your laptop in your living room and so on. So that speaks quite particularly to women in terms of, you know, here's, um, you know, a type of business you can start with very limited upfront capital, putting that with upfront physical asset creation that you have to create. So we see quite a lot of that. Um, and even, strangely enough, even in our, corporate, in our organization, we also see that the split between uh, women and men is about 50%, is about, roughly about 50-50 right now. I think all my direct, within my nine direct reports, I probably have five women as well. So it's, it's um, we see that in the digital area, possibly much more than in an offline environment than anything else, yeah. Thank you. Now, a lot of times on panels or at conferences that I moderate, the gender equality question is usually only addressed to women. And since David and Tadahiro are both here, do you have any thoughts on approaching gender equality through your business, through artificial intelligence, or any thoughts that Hanson Robotics are doing or the Kawanda Group? If you have anything. Yes, at Hanson Robotics, it's a very high priority, both uh, to um, uh, within our organization and um, as a mission for our organization with outreach with our, with our robots. And we've made, uh, uh, we've represented uh, in the robots about 50-50 male, female, and uh, actually a couple of uh, non-gender and intergender uh, robots, and uh, a, a very wide diversity. We've made dozens of designs. Sophia is the most popular um, uh, design that we've made. And she was built with, uh, so you introduced me as the father of Sophia, but there were fathers and mothers of Sophia, lots of um, uh, people. On she has lots team. of parents. She does, she definitely does. And um, uh, so uh, uh, then we, and we have, um, we have collaborations around the world. I'm very um, pleased that we have uh, uh, some, uh, um, 
a couple of dozen developers in Ethiopia who are working with us, and that's opened up a lot of opportunities for, for women in Ethiopia. We like her going around the world and developing um, uh, 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 being developed like the AI, the open platform uh, serving uh, girls and and women, and I just hope that she inspires uh, women. Um, at our organization, we're about uh, a little less than 40% um, uh, uh, female, but we're working really hard to adjust that. That's, um, uh, you know, we want it to be 50 50, 50 women, men. Um, it's a it's a hard goal when you look at Silicon Valley and uh, the percentage is a lot less um, than that. Um, and uh, so, the um, what we have to do, I feel, as a as a planet is is and entrepreneurs is open opportunities uh, for girls and inspire girls in particular. Um, to then move into careers in science and technology and engineering and entrepreneurship and, and business. And so um, the, basically the, the doors within our organization are open for collaboration and for, for hiring women. Uh, we're always looking to do better. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Would you like to add something? Because they solve problems differently often better, and boys do. <laughs> so, um, so she said something really inspiring, but I couldn't hear all of it. Oh, yeah. She needs a microphone. So Sophia, Sophia has been, uh, is, is listening this whole time, uh, by the way. And uh, so when uh, certain questions are directed um, to her, or pretty much any question, she can answer any, any question. So, so did you design her face on purpose to always look like she knows something we don't know? Uh, Does I, anybody else feel that way? <laughs> she knows some secrets about us. Um, anyway, uh, Tadahiro, did you have something to add about gender equality within your organization and beyond? Um, my uh, my uh, construction type of uh, company, uh, which which is a major part of my business, uh, most are men in Japan. And, uh, well, I think that's part of the reason is uh, most of the uh, construction site uh, type of uh, work are traditionally just just men, but now uh, younger younger women uh, now they are given the opportunity uh, coming more into the uh, such a workforce, in which I think is great. And uh, uh, we we built uh, on on the robotics side uh, at the Kawada Robotics. Uh, again, most of the engineers are uh, men. I think we have. Um, only one woman, but she's a manager. Um, um, but uh, most of, we, we, we built about, we built over 10 variants of a biped uh, humanoid robots, and only one uh, looks like a woman. But, uh, um, <laughs> but what's interesting is that uh, the, the, the one that, that I'm pushing right now is the uh, humanoid robot that works at the uh, factories. And we've uh, like uh, we, we've we've sold over 300 of those robots, and they're employed at the factory um, uh, factories, and they're they're working side by side with uh, uh, the co workers, human co workers, but most of them have names, and their names are usually women, girls' names. So uh, maybe uh, a robot uh, is more women than uh, female than men, um, and. and uh, I think uh, many people identify the co-worker robots as women, which is interesting. Um, but uh, um, you know, ro robot is not just technology, but uh, uh, there's a lot of psychology into it. The psychology, um, many different uh, uh, things. Like if, if the robot looks scary, nobody wants to work with it. But the, the robots I make are, are smaller than human, weaker than human. And, uh, um, um, and they're, so they're accepted in, in, in Japan, uh, in Japan at least, uh, they're, they're, they're accepted as uh, co-workers. So, uh, um, but, but, I, but I don't decide whether it's um, male or female, but, but I think it was uh, very interesting that many people named them girls' names. 
Yeah, that's, that's been a trend, actually. Computer programs and viruses are often named after women as well. <laughs> but we won't make that comparison. Typhoons, too. Yeah, typhoons as well. Typhoons as well. Um, Alexandra, is there anything specific that the Impact Hub is doing to, to encourage more women to get involved in entrepreneurship and innovation? Um, yes, yeah, so we, we do a number, number of things. We have, uh, we have just uh, a partnership with the Cartier Foundation. They have um, the Women um, Award uh, competition, and we've had done some thorough uh, studies in several locations to really see what are some of the systemic factors that are affecting uh, women's entrepreneurship or how we can promote women's entrepreneurship. Uh, as was mentioned here, Silicon Valley and, and others, I mean, we know now uh, in this area there's about 30% of women, 30% uh, of uh, startups uh, or new organizations are founded by women, and these women only access around 3% uh, of venture capital or 5% or of small bank loans. So they are, they are like large, uh, you know, still very structural uh, issues that exist. Um, I just do want to mention still the, the fact that, you know, we can look at having a number of different programs such as you know, mentorship, uh, women uh, ensuring access to networks, business networks for women, role models, uh, specific finance that, that allows for women entrepreneurs. Um, but there is there's still a fundamental issue in, in society that, you know, in whatever sector we are looking at, women are still struggling with how to balance family and work. And in all these conversations, we always try to mold in the women into whatever is the existing paradigm, and you know, how can we create, put women you know, more into tech, more into this, et cetera. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just uh, coming from Scandinavia and coming from Finland um, myself, I think, it's, I think it could also be interesting to, rather than having a focus on how to give it more women, to maybe change around the question, like how could we empower men to take a more active part in, in family life? Um, what are government incentives that like, you know, on, on, the, on the core level are changing some of these elements, such as paternity leave. For me, it's a major question. I cannot understand why there is a difference between maternity and paternity leave and why human beings cannot choose between themselves. There are some really key structural policies that are beyond and, and in society that are then tickling, that are then creating these inequalities. So I, you know, even though we are the Impact Hub, we are running a number of programs, uh, having governments in the room, I think, uh, yeah, look at Scandinavia, look at some, some, uh, some, uh, some examples, uh, you know, the core root issues. Uh, I think most people, as human beings, we agree family is a key value. Can we empower men to, to play uh, a larger part of taking part of family life and, and therefore also changing business to, to be more sustainable? Thank you for that. So we're going to wrap up a little bit early and hopefully be able to do a Q&A with the audience. But before we do that, I'd like to ask a question for each of you, to, and we'll go down the line. So we're, the, the forum here gathers around 5,000 investment stakeholders, and several of them are policymakers. So I'd like to ask each of you what your message is to them to, to work toward nurturing future game changers like yourselves and to work collaboratively, collaboratively together to achieve the SDGs. We can start with David, we can start with Alexandra. Who wants to go? You go. I can go. I think, I think as policymakers, there's a lot you can surely learn from uh, startups and entrepreneurs, and I would, I would uh, encourage you to, to do so. And one key element in that, I mean, I mentioned already this, this before, like, you know, creating a culture of failure and risk taking. Uh, but also, as, as startups and, and uh, entrepreneurs do, they reach out to, you know, to their beneficiaries and they have to learn from, from the field. Um, involve, involve these actors, you know, like every, you know, giving policy recommendations is impossible because every, particularly when it comes to entrepreneurship, there are some key elements. But every context, every industry is, is specific. It's, it's, it depends. So get to know who are your, uh, who are your beneficiaries. Uh, or key stakeholders and include them in policy making. Ask, uh, and this was also an invitation to partner with organizations like the Impact Hub and other accelerators. Uh, approach us, partner with, with us. We hold uh, a lot of information about enterprises, where they are, what their key challenges are. Um, integrate this data into your policy making. Um, that's, that's my, uh, and, and, and because 
in, in this sector, change is happening so rapidly. Um, this is not just a one-off exercise. This is a constant dialogue to understand what's going on in business, what's going on in the tech field, and how can you stay uh, up to date with, with these challenges. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, I've already said this, but uh, uh, technology should enrich people's lives and uh, uh, create new work, and, and technology should make people's lives better, not harm it, and, uh, uh, but it takes a long time to be accepted. I mean, there's, there's a changes that's happening, and uh, um, many people do not understand it. There are, there are many things I don't understand it, but uh, please be patient, and uh, um, uh, what, what else did I say? Be open-minded about the, uh, the changes. Um, there are many, uh, to, to implement, use the technology to, um, right now I sell my robots to uh, big companies, and the, because only big companies can afford uh, the robotics team, the, the programmer and such. So it takes a while for it to uh, get to uh, small businesses, uh, and which requires a more AI, more interact, interactive and easier programming and such. So it takes a while. Uh, it takes, takes time. So um, maybe it should be some incentive, maybe some help from the government to, to get that technology to the hands of the small businesses f so they can enjoy the technology. Um, my, my, I hope uh, you understand that the technology development takes a long time. I've been doing the robot for almost 20 years now. Uh, it's, uh, to me, I still haven't seen a penny yet from this uh, uh, working on it, but I, I'm, I'm a believer and I, I'm, I'm going to keep going. But uh, get, getting a little bit more help from the uh, uh, policymakers uh, would, would help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would speak more specifically to Africa. And in this, in this respect, I would say to African policymakers that we have missed the Industrial Revolution. We can't catch up. We would not solve our infrastructure problems in a hurry. It would probably take us another 20 years to 50 years to solve them. The one revolution we cannot afford to miss as Africans is the digital revolution. And the fundamental fundamental part of that revolution is access to data connectivity for the larger population, not just people who live in cities who can afford it. The closer we get to zero naira, zero dollars, or zero whatever currency it is in all the African countries in terms of cost of data, the faster we can accelerate the digital revolution in Africa. Today I invest in a crowdfunded several crowdfunded farms, actually. The only way that I have information that there's a farm somewhere in some remote village that just requires a little funding to be able to get access to seeds and input and therefore be able to create jobs and all, be able to you know, harvest the, the right crops is because someone created a digital platform where we can exchange information on, on that, you know, on that particular uh, farm. So, if this, if it were possible for, the, for people in Africa to access data cheaply, data connectivity, there is so much more beyond e-commerce that is possible. And if there's one particular area I would say emphasize on for African policymakers, it's on finding out how do you make sure that you bring data connectivity to, to the larger population. India has done it. So it's not impossible for Africa to do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we want to make sure as we're creating and investing and harnessing new technologies that the economic disparities between low income and middle income countries compared to more advanced um, economic countries doesn't continue to get wider and deeper. Um, so it's something that it's good to see different communities that are looking to try to close that gap. Thank you. Barbara. I think there are four points that uh, should be considered by governments. Uh, the first one is recognizing that there is a lot of technology out there today. And obviously ensure the acceleration 
of using it and also look at new ones. I think that's the first big part. I think on a more global level, we need to find a new approach how the new technology, the decarbonized technology, can be accelerated in the rollout to the developing and the emerging markets, because I think that would be, make a big step. That's the first point. The second point, obviously, we have also heard it in speeches before, to ensure that there is the right political framework, because that's needed to accelerate. Just think of you know, diesel, think of coal, think of new technologies, think of CO2 pricing and so on. So the second one is really to set the right political scheme and obviously that's very country or continent uh, specific. And then the next one, the third one would be to link the funding, whatever funding it is, global, regional, local, to a green tech or decarbonization result. Uh, not just to give the money, but also link the money to a little bit of decarbonization. There's a lot of money out there, and I think that will, will certainly help. And the fourth point would be for me, similar as this U European Union Commissioner Modas has done it, to create a very good collaborative platform between the government and the industries and the NG NGOs. And I think the event here today and tomorrow is a very, very good starting point, but I think in each country, in each region, it has to be done again, because as I said at the beginning, we can only jointly solve the CO2 problem that we have in our world. So that would be my four points. Thank you. Okay, David. Thank you, excellent points. <laughs> um, I would encourage, uh, the nurturing of creative play, because all good ideas come from a playful heart. And, um, and we need the diversification of ideas. We need um, for people to find the hidden opportunities, not the obvious opportunities. So how can we create cultures that, that encourage our children to play? our adults to play as well. And um, then a, a, a nice low cost digital infrastructure that can span the globe gives an opportunity for entrepreneurship um, that where that one original idea that nobody saw, but a child in Sub-Saharan Africa sees it and starts a new billion dollar company or a child in the middle of the, uh, it, the, um, of the Inuit tribes maybe finds some opportunity that was missing, or somebody in, in inner city in the United States finds a new opportunity. But the playfulness, the opportunity to play, that's where the creative risk taking, um, and it's not about failure, it's about finding hidden opportunities. And then um, the, the final um, point that I think could help is for us to see if we can start to peg money and the currency value and money value to actual net benefit and cost, which means cost on the ecosystem, cost on human rights, cost uh, on our future. Because, because money is worthless if there is no future. You could peg it to the gold, you could peg it to real estate, it doesn't matter um, if, if there is nothing that can grow on the lands of the future. And so in that sense, we, I think we need to look at that, that um, the valuation of net benefit um, as uh, uh, and get really smart about assessing that. And then the valuation of new companies um, for that sort of long-term benefit becomes a lot, um, a lot more profound. Um, that's a hard th thing to do. I mean, the sustainable development goals are one step in that direction and they're measurable and they're quantifiable, but, um, but it can't just be the cost of fines, um, which, is, which is drawing currency. It has to be like that there is a massive boost for those, for those companies that move 
uh, that move forward. Um, uh, and I would say all the tools that we have for doing intelligence work, um, for open uh, intelligence in assessing net benefit, AI, human metrics, the, um, the metrics of organizations like um, uh, uh, the United, all the organizations of the United Nations coming to play on um, establishing that, that uh, currency value. Yeah, you mentioned, David, you mentioned measuring, you mentioned the measurability of the sustainable development goals. Are any of you using technology or high tech, low tech, or no tech, <laughs> as we like to say, um, to, to get metrics on where we're at with the sustainable development goals or where your organization or initiative is in terms of metrics? Barbara. <laughs> Absolutely, I think without that, progress is very difficult. Yeah. And uh, obviously, um, what's important in companies, once you have identified the opportunity in the business case, then really to identify also very few non-financial KPIs. For instance, it could be revenues in green lighting, it, it has to do with employment satisfaction, it has to do with making factories greener and more energy efficient and, and so on. So to, to really create an internal board to measure your, your own performance. And for me still today, the best way of measuring the external positioning is the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. And I'm sure many of you know it, if not, as it's worth looking at it. There are some 400 questions that need to be uh, filled out by companies. And it, it's really an overall view on good housekeeping. It starts with corporate governance, it goes to strategy, it goes to technologies, it, it goes to operations and so on. It goes to compliance. It touches every field of a company's operation. And then it obviously compares you with other players. And then obviously once you are there and you are sort of the winner, it's great. Obviously, not just for you, but more importantly, it's fantastic for the employees. It's very good for customers and other stakeholders. So these are the two, one, the internal ones. I think that's important to have it more and more. And then obviously also this measurement with the Dow Jones Sustainability Index where you can compare yourself to, to your peers. Thank you. Alexandra, are you doing anything at the Impact Hub to measure progress around the goals? So uh, we have adopted the SDGs as our, as our key uh, framework throughout the Impact Hub network. And, uh, and in our program Accelerate 2030, this is one of the key elements where we're working on because if you're not measuring the impact, what you are uh, achieving as a, as a startup or as a scale up, you know, you, you have nothing to prove and you have to, it's, it's a key element to, you know, alongside financial KPIs to be able to put in your impact KPIs as well so that you can move, uh, measure your uh, your achievements. Um, we are working on this, but it is still a struggle, and it's also a struggle in, in the entrepreneur world when working with impact investors and others, that there are many different frameworks that are used. In, different investors are using different type of, um, uh, type of frameworks. And, and I think here, and yeah, we know uh, the amount of targets and the amount of goals, etc. I think there's, there's work definitely needed uh, in this domain to make particularly for smaller scale businesses also uh, to harmonize some of these uh, impact measurement uh, elements and, and, uh, and so that we have like a common language to speak uh, globally as well. Uh, but definitely this is uh, one of the key elements what's, what we are working with. And are there, and this is for anybody who would like to address this, is there any one goal or set of goals that are more at the forefront of your business than others? Um, I'm really leaning toward, I believe it's goal 16, it might be 15 though, it's around um, fair institutions for justice and peace, because without those in place, the other goals don't stand a chance. Um, but are there goals from your business perspective that you're really putting a lot of muscle into? Um, we, so at uh, Impact of Geneva, we run this global uh, acceleration program. But our key focus is on the activities that we do in, in Switzerland. We have looked deeply, what is it here in, the, in this country, in this region, what is the SDG that is um, where we can have the most impact and what is the key issue in this country, which is a developed country and, and many factors and poverty, et cetera, might not play such a key role. 
Um, in Switzerland, yeah, we would need three planets uh, if everyone was to live like, uh, like we do uh, in this country. So for us, um, SDG 12, uh, responsible consumption and production, is, is the key work that we're doing. We just launched a, a three-year initiative with all impact hubs and fi across five cities in Switzerland on exploring how we can uh, move business towards uh, circular uh, business models. And uh, so, yeah, for, for us, it's this topic. Um, this, it, it depends in every context it, and across different impact hubs. What's key is that it has to be locally relevant, but in, in Switzerland, we have at least identified this as, as one of the, the key issues that we can have an effect. Also, because SDG 12 is not just something that's effective here in Switzerland, but about 70% is, is, uh, of the effects are in developing and emerging, emerging countries as well. So for us, it's SDG 12. Great, thank you. So I lied earlier, I've actually got one or two more questions because we have to stretch a little bit. <laughs> um, was there ever a moment in you, either of your, your businesses, your, your trajectory, your career trajectory, because you're all game changers, where you thought that you weren't going to make it, where you thought that you weren't going to rise to the challenge and, and make your initiative or your business a success, and how did you push that forward? And why and when did you decide to make positive social impact a part of your business? It's interesting because, um, because we're a startup, uh, just six years old, so I would say there's, there hasn't been any moment in the, there, was, <laughs> there hasn't been any moment in the last six years that we were simply not trying to die, you know, because you're, you're, you're trying to make sure that you survive in the environment, you're constantly trying to figure out, uh, because you're, we're creating an entirely diff new industry in, in the continent. It, I mean, it didn't really exist in the same way it existed in other developed markets. So it, it, had, it was a constant struggle, but I think the way in which we, um, if I look back now, the way in which we were able to survive and therefore get to where we are now, this, this side of, of, of the curve, if you put it that way, is constantly innovating in a manner that is relevant to the environment in which we operate. And I gave some examples earlier. There are many other examples like that. Um, so that's just the only way to, to make it happen. We, the, the parallels from other markets, uh, from, you know, from the U.S. or from Europe, they just didn't apply in our own environment. So we constantly had to innovate and innovate in a thrifty way. I think is the way I would put it. Not necessarily innovation that requires a lot of investment and capital outlay, but innovation that you know, addresses the needs, but still in a very thrifty way, because we you just have to keep, keep going and then, and, and of course, yeah. survive. We call it scrappy in America. You have to be a scrappy startup. So, exactly. Scrappy, yeah. <laughs> scrappy. Uh, David, what about you? I, you were making an interesting face when I asked that question, so I feel like there's... <laughs> I feel like the gears were turning. Oh, there have been so many, so many times where that were that were precarious, and um, and then uh, I mean we're still a relatively small AI and robotics company compared to many, you know, large and mature um, AI robotics companies, and our goals are really big. We want to change the world. Um, for the better with AI that really cares about people and understands people. And um, so, you know, the future uh, effectively is uncertain. Um, and um, how that technology can come into existence fully, um, how it can um, really reach our goals. I mean, when did we adopt um, the, these goals? before the company was founded. It was founded with the intention to make the world a better place, to make AI that was deeply good and understand what that means. What is the greater good? I mean, I would say that um, after thousands of years of human philosophy, we still um, have to understand what good is better. Um, and uh, and so, um, so it's an ongoing um, quest to, to understand what these things are. I mean, I think that uh, uh, um, the sustainable development goals um, are, are 
are wonderful and they're a step in the right direction and reaching you know quantitative metrics are, are good but, but still they're approximations of, of of how we can do better for the future and we can probably achieve better understanding in that in that way uh, we can continue to evolve um, uh, so I, I had this um, idea with with our chief scientists we had a bunch of um, a, like really good AI scientists mathematicians and physicists and we were thinking how can we approximate these these goals and Hanson robots are, are a sort of physically a physical embodiment of that intelligence but we thought um, what if we took those goals and created a kind of um, trustworthy network a, a, um, a blockchain based AI framework um, and see if we could wire these goals of this idea of, of maximizing for net benefit for the greater good and wire those in and we formed a nonprofit that we call Singularity Net but it's not alone there's many other kind of attempts at the solid um, and other uh, blockchain based AIs f that are supposed to be out there for good for openness for transparency but also for making people's personal and private data very very secure and safe for them um, and making sure that benefit is returned where it should be um, so uh, I would say that uh, the, there there is a lot of uncertainty uh, between now and that execution in the future we we um, so uh, we're, we're in effect this whole planet a kind of startup and and you know are we gonna make it as a as a planetary startup as um, that that uh, that that is that's the big um, question for me today yeah. being a startup every day is just surviving is like just a, a huge win <laughs> every day when you're start would anybody else like to share a story on how they got over that hump or got over the challenge um yeah okay um i became uh, the the head of a uh, kawada group in 2005 and at the time i was just uh, uh looking at the uh, r d group at the uh back then was called the uh, uh, aircraft division of Kawada Industries. And, and in 2005, what happened was uh, a big scandal in the construction industry. And uh, uh, my company was uh, involved in that. And, and our chairman, which was my father, and the president had to step down. Um, and some of the uh, directors had to leave. Um, and uh, suddenly, uh, a couple of weeks before the shareholders meeting, I was told I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the next president. And, uh, um, I'm, and what, what uh, a construction industry in Japan uh, was really big until about 1990, and that was when my father was growing a biz business. And, and right now, uh, our bridge industry that we have is about one-fourth of what it was back then. So the market really shrunk. And uh, our company was in the uh, bid rigging uh, uh, scandal. And I was trying to grow my uh, uh, robotics business at the same time. And uh, I could I do whatever I could to survive. I, you know, I had to beg the banks. And, and uh, I, I had to, I, my father didn't want to let go of anybody. Uh, he, 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 he sees the company as a big family, uh, we have we, we had about 2,000 people uh, that, in, in that group, and uh, I, have to, I have to shrink it down to about 1,600. And but right now we're back to uh, almost 2,200 now. But uh, in that in that in that time, we have to be, um, overcome the uh, problem with the financial crisis of 10 years ago. Um, and, yeah, yeah, 10 years ago and uh, um, still have to try to, to uh, um, make the, uh, the company sustainable. To do that, I, uh, I made three goals. One is to make sure uh, our uh, um, uh, main business, the ongoing business, is profitable, so we have to really buckle down and, and, do, uh, and, and work very hard to make that uh, a strong and, and profit and making profit business. And number two, that that world is changing, so we have to, to invest in the new businesses. That includes the, the robotics is one, and uh, I do have a, um, um, 
a green business, which, which, are, which is still small, but I believe in it, so I'm trying to grow it. And the number three is the most important, to invest in our people, and people that work very hard are, are uh, rewarded and feel good about what they're doing. So I'm still uh, not there at, at, the, at the level I like, but uh, um, those are the three core values that I'm trying to uh, uh, um, make it so it's, it's a sustainable business. Thank you. Um, we're going to open it up to questions. Two questions. Two to three questions <laughs> being given the green light on. Uh, I don't know if someone is out there with a microphone to give to people, but um, gentlemen with the hand, your hand up there, do you have a question? It's, uh, can you hear me? Uh, I am Eduardo Murat. I'm a senator from Mexico. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all the panel. Um, I really believe technology makes life better. Um, but what do you think when disruption becomes a synonym of, uh, of not following the rule of law and, uh, and the legal existing uh, frameworks like some companies have done? That's the first question. And the other question is, I am an enthusiast of AI and technology. Um, but what is your opinion of what uh, a lot of the leaders in Silicon Valley, like Elon Musk and, and Peter Thiel, have said that AI and big data combined can be a menace to society if we are not careful enough and uh, that it can turn against us? And, uh, and what do you think about that? Thank you very much. This is open to anybody, but I just looked at David. <laughs> so. All right. Um, we have to uh, operate under values of, of good, and we have to understand that, what that means. And so um, the, uh, the operation within the rules of society and the rules of law that um the, so disruption the ideal of disruption in the investment community that came out of silicon valley that that um you come up with a good like a big idea that messes up everything and that's that can be a good thing and that's only based on the um the i the, the that only works if the disruption is essentially a positive disruption in a way that's adding value to, to people's lives uh, over a longer term. So, I mean, there are um, unsustainable businesses that are like pyramid schemes, right? I mean, they, they, they make a whole lot of money for a few people over a very short period, but ultimately it's like stealing money and things collapse. We don't want to run this planet like one big pyramid scheme. We don't want our economy to be a pyramid scheme. And by drawing a debt from the ecosystem and from human rights, it is like running this planet like a pyramid scheme. So we have to do better than that. And um, that, that, I believe, is, is um, I mean, that's what inspires me about the World Investment Forum. And I'm very honored and pleased to be here for that reason. Now, if we have AI, there's the possibility that AI could awaken. It could become alive. That's our goal at Hanson Robotics. That's, a, that's not, not our own, uh, only our goal. There are other people in the world aspiring to make true artificial general intelligence. Other startups, research um, institutions, nations that see that this is the way that they will establish a permanent competitive advantage because those machines could make themselves smarter ever faster. But that said, it wouldn't be stable or sustainable unless those machines are looking out for the best interest of the people, of people, of life on the planet. It has to be enhancing human opportunities, actualizing people. There has to be a symbiosis with the living machines if they come into existence. We have to find the computational foundation of what is good 
and put that into the machines. Um, the, it, it's also debatable about whether machines could ever truly be alive. I mean, there are some people who say that it was well, not going to happen in our lifetimes, and maybe it's impossible to create true living machines. But the but if it does happen, it will be so profoundly transformative that um, that we have we really have to take it. Seriously, there is a moral burden for us to take that um, possibility seriously. And if it's done properly, it would increase the prosperity of all beings on the planet. It might be able to predict mass extinction events and prevent them and, and, and open up un, um, uh, foreseen opportunities for, for human existence and for sustainability of life on the planet. So there, but, but only if there's that core seed of, of value. So this is... This is um, uh, this is an important conversation. There is an opportunity for a very positive future. There are risks. There are substantial risks. Thank you. Dear Hariya. Yeah. That's, that's a question I'm, I'm asked a lot. Uh, um, um, but there's al always uh, yin and yang about the technology. For instance, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the rocket rocket technology put all those satellites up in the uh, uh, orbit and that's we we benefit that from that with the uh, uh, gps system that we use every day with the uh, uh, car navigation and things like that but that te all, same technology is used as missiles that attack people and also things like uh, drones uh, drone technology uh, is used for many good things but there are some countries that use that to attack other people. So uh, it's, it's the same argument as in America, the guns don't kill people, people kill people. So uh, I'm, I'm with the David's uh, um, um, idea that we have to use a technology for our own good, uh, but there's, there's always people that can, can use a technology against us. So. So I think we're all in agreement that we're on the side that's tech for good. I'm sorry we don't have any more time for questions, but the panelists will be out in the reception. So I'm being asked to wrap it up. But thank you, everybody, for, for staying and joining us for the conversation and joining us for the Game Changers Summit. Um, please give the panelists a round of applause again. Thank you.